You did an interview <laughs> in which you said, it's uh, not the worst thing to slap a woman now and then. As I remember, you said you don't do it with a clenched fist. It's better to do it with an open hand. Mm. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't changed my opinion. I want a game. You know what kind of game I want. I want Metal Gear. Uh, I mean, we can port MGS2 to the GameCube. Not good enough. I want a full remake of MGS1, but this time with faces. Uh, okay, sure. Hello, Silicon Knights. Hey, Big Dick, what's up? Right, so I know you guys are busy ruining your company with that whole two human thing nobody wants. But uh, I, I want you guys to port Metal Gear Solid to the GameCube. Using MGS2's engine, sorta. Uh, I mean, I guess we could do that. Would be cool if you could, like, help out and... Producer. Oh, because this isn't exactly our field. Yeah, 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 sure. I'll, I'll fly over, thumbs up and all that. Oh, okay, cool. Sure, cool. Don't go bankrupt on me now. And so, Metal Gear Solid The Twin Snakes was born. It would be Metal Gear Solid, pretty much shot for shot verbatim, just with more graphics and a few added things here and there. Such as a first person shoot mode that forced them to rebuild some of the bosses as it entirely breaks the game. Like, sure, in MGS2 even, it lowered the difficulty in some parts, but at least that game was designed around it, featuring more of a claustrophobic hallway design, preventing you from popping all of the dudes from level entry doorframe, but Shadow Moses ain't like that, which doesn't exactly ruin the game. The pacing, the overall game feel, and its addictive core are still very much intact. It's just a fuck of a whole lot more easier. But yeah, aside from breaking the whole thing, they also tweaked the script somewhat, re-recording lines for dramatic effect, and getting an actual action scene director on board by the name of Ryuhei Kitamura. This resulted in a few points of contention among the fans. Mei Ling, for example, no longer sounds like she's playing PUBG, but instead like someone who actually grew up in the States. And Naomi no longer has that terribly fake British accent. The rest of the voices would remain the same though, with a more thickly layered on tone. Which is actually in line with what the series would sound like MGS2 onward. I mean, Naomi and Mei Ling return in 4, for instance, where they will have these exact voices, and even the gruntier Snake and Campbell would very much stick around. It's just that, you know, it's different. The OG felt very down-to-earth comparatively, and to some, mainly those who grew up with it and are just used to shit being this way, it would remain the better version. Unanimously hated, however, would be the work of Action Hank the Director Man. Dude loves his Matrix shit, you see? And where this did make everything involving Grey Fox about 10 times cooler, it also made Snake seem like a fucking superhero. Perfectly personified by this bit here, where he fucking somersaults a doorframe for absolutely no fucking reason. Shit's goofy and feels really out of place in a universe as otherwise grounded in reality as Metal Gear. A talking cat. So things were going well. Silicon Knights were doing the remake. One of Kojima's clones, Shujo Murata, was hard at work on a sequel to Zone of the Enders. Shinta was busy on another Metal Gear spin-off. And so Hideo figured that he'd take the time to work on another game. Which is where Ikuya Nakamura comes into play. The man who would direct the controller vibration in MGS1, which... You know, I, I guess that requires a director. Though he also did the character modeling, helped work on some textures, and did all of the artwork for Ghost Babel and all of the computer bullshit interfacing from MGS2 and would continue to work on the series going forward doing the rumbles, UI designs, and he would even later dabble in level design a little bit. Man can do a bit of everything, basically, and so he was to both write and direct a game of his own. The main idea of which, likely stemming from his rumble-based controller gimmickry, would involve a GBA cartridge with solar detectors that would allow the sun IRL to influence the sun in-game. To what end? Fuck knows, I ain't played it. All I know is that Kojima accidentally walked into his office once, thus giving him the nebulous role of producer, and so now it is his game. And all of us will refer to it as such, whilst also continuing to never play it. Secretly though, Hideo's ambitions laid elsewhere. 
being that his head had grew a few inches again as he went on another midnight movie binge. He had lifted the entirety of Blade Runner before, he had jacked off the lethal weapon a good amount, and now his cum-covered cinema quest led him to Mr. It's Okay to Slap Women himself, James Bond. Probably the one where he jumps crocodiles. No Metal Gears, no snakes, no solids, just some good old spy fiction. Mud wrestling, rough in a jungle and all that. However, Konami saw those sales. Konami saw that money. And Konami wanted that blah 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 TLDR he squeezed another Metal Gear title out of these very unrelated inspirations. I'm sure this will go fine. Ah. Uh. Plummeting towards the earth like a solid brick, crawling through the grass like a solid snake, it's Naked Snake! Like, okay, <laughs> solid snake and liquid snake are things that I can kind of imagine sounding really cool to someone who doesn't know what those words mean, just like Metal Gear. It's gibberish, but it's cool gibberish. None of that stopped people from making dick jokes aplenty about it though, and while I don't think that Kojima intended for that to happen initially, I can't see Naked Snake as being anything other than a bit of post-dick joke self-awareness. Not to mention the title, Snake Eater. Naked's actually Big Boss, by the way. Yeah, that guy. As he wasn't always the gnome-stealing, mustache-twirling, arms-dealing nuke man. He was once just a guy taking orders from another guy. In a cold war also, so Naked's infiltrating a base to rescue a Russian scientist called Sokolov who's working on a weapon with nuclear mega powers. Only then, of course, he gets his ass beaten by his former mentor, Boss, who defects towards the eviler than usual evil Russians who plan to get money and fuck power, and after getting nuked and somehow being cool with that, he gets his ass sent back in, once again bricking and dicking his way inside only to be proof to bitch once more. So honestly, this dude must really need to get his sneak on in order to not die. Which means that you do so too. Snake man's, guard man's, but no Lego. <laughs> yep, the clear structures, futuristic mini maps and nano machine gadgets and other vision cones are all gone. Instead, it is a game about wits, camouflage and percentages that clearly tell you if you're visible or not. But remember, this is still a sneaking mission. Snake? If you fail this mission, it will mean an all-out nuclear war. Keep that in mind and proceed with extreme caution. Despite the tagline and what this story and presentation might tell you, the Metal Gear series hasn't really ever been about capital S stealth. Like, sure, you can, and sometimes early on, kind of need to avoid combat, but I think it's fair to say that the LEGO-based setups were very fucking rudimentary, and felt more like arcadey little puzzles where you just avoid cones until you can break the game with guns. You weren't really hiding, exactly. At least, not compared to a game like Thief or Splinter Cell, where you have lighting and shadows with which to take refuge in, a simple UI telling you how cloaked up you were, and proper pronages and crouches adding to the hidden vibes. No easily definable maps or clear geometry, just you peering around corners from the shadows trying your darndest not to get even so much as seen. And here in MGS3, they finally do that too. As I said, the nano machines weren't no thang in the 60s. Some of the sleek, snazzy sneak additions made in 2 made it in here, absolutely. Like the dodge roll and the first person and the high interactivity. In fact, much like how a bat gets here good because can't see, those very few pillars of the series have been put on fucking steroids now that the Lego gone. The simple three-punch combat, for example, has been overall to be more of a system all on its own, called CQC. <sighs> Letting you do all manner of judo-ish moves to disarm motherfuckers ASAP. The silencers on your guns also have durability now, making the game less stop and poppy, though I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't still really effective. And the few gadgets that you do have also require batteries now and are uh, not always as helpful, often emitting sounds giving you away. Which is also a thing now too. That what was that noise of MGS1, but actually MG2 fame, while neat, is now just kinda how shit be in general. Nor are the guards short-sighted at all anymore. 
meaning that you can't just run around upright like an asshole and are much better off avoiding people entirely, given that the areas are much larger as well. Hell, you straight up have survival systems now. Damage is not just a quick ration away. Like, aside from these very rare life meds, there are no insta-heals. You need to find food and treat your wounds after a particularly nasty encounter, as is indicated by these two bars. Life is life, stan is stan, and stan decides how fast life will regen, and red life is wounded life, thus capping the regen up to that point. The effects of you fucking up can very much be lasting to a certain degree, which already pushes one to sneak more, and the rest of the game supports that idea perfectly. While the camo system is pretty rudimentary, i.e. just a number saying, Yeah, you're good, and a few outfits that already give away of good just by looking at them, it turns into functionally the same thing as Thief Shadows because of one key element. Gosh. This is a stealth game. There's no hokey music and big empty rooms, just you, some jungle ambience and the elements doing their thing. Maybe you see a dude out there off in the distance, or perhaps it's just a wee froggo hopping around. The sound here is a pretty big deal. Seeing as you can't see half of the time, you might want to resort to using those stereoscopic ears of yours to hear. HQ, HQ. This is HQ. Patrol here. No problems detected. Understood. Resume your patrol. The sheer density of the jungle is really great too, with the grass, branches, puddles, mud lakes and swamps all clouding views and actually giving you a hard time moving, through you actually physically feeling the jungle as the tall pokeman grass offers up some proper resistance while walking. There's also butterflies, spiders, fish, leeches, crocs, goats, birds, frogs, snakes, swamps, squirrels, woofs, and crabs that inhabit the many lakes, trees, ditches, caves, and grass tufts, all within a fully functional ecosystem in which buns, cranch, and vultures eat corpses. Shit feels alive. Vibrant. The frame is never still, as there's always something ruffling about somewhere. Thus, making the equally camoed up guards a legit threat. Again, you just can't walk around, cartwheeling and gun shooting. Generally, the jungle setting really just wants you to go prone and maneuver like a snake as to not feel exposed and naked. Doesn't mean that the game is just nothing but crawling around though. <laughs> oh no no no. This game is easily one of the most creative sneak mans out there. If I had to catchphrase sum it up lazy reviewer style, then I'd say that this game is one big vertical slice for the entire game. Like, remember how MGS1's vertical slice had all of those gimmicks and one-off ideas like the What was that noise? The many vents, the Surveillance camera? The searchlights and all of those other ideas that never really returned in the admittedly much more straightforward rest of the game? Well, in MGS3, pretty much every area is like that. Taking the challenge per strut philosophy of MGS2 to the next logical extreme. Starting you off in a linear corridor with thick sink mud and croc, from which you pass bridge with physics and bees, upon which you will hit big base with crawl space and rooftop drop locker to pop inside of, windows to smash through, holes to peek and shoot through, barrels to push, boxes to stand on, and so many other little shits turning it into a fully fledged stealth based playground. Then you enter a giant swamp where you'll need to avoid traps, deal with leeches, fight more crocs, swim for the first time also, and climb ropes and skill trees to find the legendary croc mask. Snake, what in God's name? How does it look? It looks cool. Huh? It looks cool on you. It does? Yeah. I don't 
think cool is the right word. After which, you got this area that's kind of like a maze of mud and electrified fences with mines to avoid, docks to deal with, traps to get trapped by, and cool little walkways to walk over, and a fat as fuck branching layout, only to lead you to another base, where you also have multiple ways in, boasting trenches, rooftops, doors, and also helicopter. A next generation chopper that's a little smaller than the hip. Maybe we should call it a hind. Hmm, huh, not bad. It's cool with me. Then it's settled. We'll refer to that new type helicopter as a hind from now on. Which you're able to preemptively blow up, by the way, as to not have to deal with it later, as well as being able to blow their communication devices so the guards can call for backup and destroy their food supplies so they get hungry, thus affecting their performance. And after all of that, you get the first boss, which is a cool Mexican standoff with clever cover, climbable trees, and the return of the bees. Afterwards, you drop into a dark, dank cave where you are literally left to your own devices in regards to seeing. You could wait for your eyes to adjust, use goggles if you have them, find the torch, use the cigar, or get hopelessly lost in this winding motherfucker of a cave. And, uh, yeah, I, I could go on, but every area is its own self-contained stealth-based playground that's oh, either no. on or way above MGS1 opening tier with how it's built for maximum approaches. I think what's really strong about this as well, mind you, is that it doesn't reuse anything. There's no backtracking and card key shenanigans here. You're always moving forward with shit never not feeling new. It's pretty great. And besides, Snake's Garbo Arsenal, applicable to any area, is equally expansive, being that you can throw snakes, sick poisonous frogs on them, distract using ammo. Huh? I hear something. There's nothing here. I hear something. Though, uh, props to the AI for being smart enough as to not set off their own traps. And use stinky camo to scare motherfuckers off with your musky snake. Not to mention all of the food experimentation. why they call it the bringer of sleep. What? Oh, I looked the word Spatsa up afterwards and found out it means bringer of sleep in Russian. Well... But anyway... Plus, you get some neat guns and even this wee segment where you need a disguise to... That was easy. Artists expand upon shit. You'll have this one idea in your head, which will then be the greatest idea ever. But your own skills, budget, or general situation will hold you back in fully realizing it. Hence why I will sometimes repeat certain jokes in different contexts to make better, or revisit a certain type of song when I've learned more in regards to making something like that. It's a sound technique that every creative person will use lest they be a stagnant bitch. And Kojima-san and his team will no doubt be any different. Sure, in Metal Gear 1, he could do that missile idea that he thought was neat, but... I mean, look at it. <laughs> Clearly, this needs poisonous gases to create more tension by way of time limits, or maybe even some gun turrets that can take the missile out if you wait around too long. And when our baby boy Shinta saw that, he thought, But what if we do that? But, like, turn it into, like, an entire stage, like, yeah. Upon which, Kojima said, Yes, this is neat. But what if we do that also, but in 3D, with elevation? And so then, shit got finalized, never showing up ever again. And similarly, while it was neat that in Metal Gear 1 you could wear a disguise to bypass the burly dudes, I don't think it's all that controversial to say that Metal Gear Solid 2's version, with the eye scanning and the actually walking the fuck around, was quite the improvement. Though, I guess it was also quite limited. I mean, just, just look at what James Bond can do. He infiltrates fancy balls and punches the guests to get game overs. That's so much cooler, Kojima thought. Which is why in MGS3 you don the disguise of a scientist, thus letting you walk around more freely, using cigar gas spray gadgets to stun motherfuckers, but also needing to avoid the other nerds lest they may not recognize you as one of their own for Big Boss Too Cool.
Additionally, you also get to dress up as a sadist general, giving you full free reign to do all manner of dumb shit, like being able to beat up nerds. Howdy gamers! What's Gucci? Remember how we were really offended in a rational and totally non-emotional, factual way by how we were emasculated due to being forced to play as Raiden? Well, Kojima's gone and done it again. Not only because he had Snake first appear in this stupid Raiden mask, nearly giving me a manly heart attack, but they also put Raiden in the game again. This time as a Russian general who wears sexy pants and is gay with the villain. Gay, I tell you! How dare they! Kojima better watch his back now, shouldn't he, gamers? As it might just be time to rise. Johnny's daddy was guarding Snake's cell, also called Johnny just as well. A cold he had with a nasty sneeze, yet Snake couldn't fool him as guards could now get on their knees. You best behave yourself. Impressed he was not by Snake's knocking and fork, but alas poor Johnny was still a dog. For Snake had a ghost friend giving him cheats, and before Johnny knew it, he was put back to sleep. Oh, poor Johnny. Oh, poor pooping Johnny. So, MGS3 is now much more of an actual game, <laughs> seeing as you can have, like, three screens in a row without cutscenes? That's nearly 30 minutes of uninterrupted play! But even still, the cutscenage and codecage are quite brill. The main banter cast this time consisting out of Major Zero, the guy who tell you what do but also mad and British and loves James Bond. Paramedic, the girl who save and tells you about the local flora and fauna but also loves movies and is a weeaboo. And lastly, Sigurd, a gun nut who tells you about guns and other items. It was my destiny to be here. In the box. Destiny? Yeah. And then when I put it on, I suddenly got this feeling of inner peace. I can't put it into words. I feel safe. Like this is where I was meant to be. Like I'd found the key to true happiness. Uh-huh. Does any of that make sense? Not even a little. You should come inside the box. Then you'll know what I mean. Man, I don't want to know what you mean! Comic Relief is the name of the game here. These three are stuck together on a fly ship getting drunk while Snake is out there asking them all manner of dumb shit. Yeah, well, anyway, that face paint doesn't look all that useful. Go ahead and wear it if you want, but I think you should change too. You don't need to change anything. Why not? It makes them look awesome. Doesn't it? Funnily enough though, besides Eva, the big booby 60s love interest spy lady who had been stationed here for a while and thus can tell you all the various ins and outs about the base thus giving shit context like telling you about the sewage systems blah 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 you get the reused reused point by now, you don't actually talk to anyone else on codec. It is a small, mostly optional, but so furiously well thought out team with many a dynamics. Snake, look at your body. Yep. Looking good. So I guess it's a good thing then that we have villains aplenty. Thing is, is that when Snake's mentor, aka the boss, defected to the evil Russian wannabe world conqueror Volgen and his best boy Ocelot, she also brought along her team of anime terrorists, as it just wouldn't be an MGS game without them. Now, of course, they hang around for the entire game, fleshing themselves out properly over time. Right? He shoots me! Okay, so maybe these guys aren't very deep at all. Much like the stop and pop me men of 2D days past, they show up, say some bullshit, only to then promptly explode. Shallow on purpose, pretty much. Hokey villains referencing the past as the game as a whole does so too. It is fitting, and it is neat, and above all, pretty fucking hilarious. There's the pain who shoots bees, the fear who shoots poison, the end who has the most underwhelming boss fight ever. What? 
weird because because I'd swear there would be more to say there, but whatever. The Fury, aka Yuri Gagarin, back from space now having lost his mind, becoming a sun ghost, and the Sorrow, aka the only motherfucker who's flashed out at all, showing up all over the place giving Snake ghost cheats, and also actually a really cool boss fight that isn't really a fight at all, instead confronting you with the many, many, many casualties that you've made along the way. Volgen, by the way, the main villain is also like the most 1D motherfucker ever. Right out of the gate, he opens up the nuke cases like an eager child, laughs maniacally and says, Excellent. Gets all rapey and nukes a place that you were just at. Much like Big Boss, I guess, was originally, Volgen is the mustache twirling, giggling, quipping, immature asshole motherfucker who fittingly gets right in the end too. There's a, there's probably some symbolism there, uh, especially when you consider that Snake Boss is by far the funniest dude what this series has ever seen. Big grins upon seeing opportunities and jokes of flirts aplenty too. The James Bond inspirations are very clearly visible to say the least. Though, unlike the big 0069, Snack is honestly kind of a rookie ass bitch. Anytime something cool happens, like people jumping motorcycles, doing crazy shooting, or instigating love, it is always someone else doing it. Mainly Eva. Like, <laughs> yeah, she might blatantly shove her tits in your face, and while her boobs may be fake, her non existent tattoos certainly wouldn't be as she is one crazy ass badass, always one step ahead of everyone else essentially taking the role that Snake had in 2, reverting Snake to more of a Raiden part 2. Uh, he, he did it again you guys, C comedic genius Hideo Kojima, pictured here on playground equipment, wearing a sombrero, saying that he's not a gay, wearing a big dick shirt, he is very funny and self aware. It. It, you know, you know it, it's almost like someone else wrote all of this, but but I, I can't help but feel that that's something for a later video. I, I, I don't know. Even more bitch than Snake, though, is Ocelot, actually being a rookie full-on, getting schooled multiple times by Snake, who's still pretty ballsy in his own right. He does Jojo poses, has his goons, unlocks a few fetishes along the way. Watching this has made me realize something. <laughs> it's really not that bad. It's the ultimate form of expression. And he also meows. <coughs> Though, with him being as close to Volgan as he is, it does make you wonder if he might have some objectives of his own still. What's also neat is that when you kill him, you get a... Snake, what have you done? You changed the future! You've created a time paradox! Notice how that's Colonel Campbell yelling at you there, by the way, highlighting that this might be a simulation uh, recreation of some kind. Which kind of brings me to the fourth wall being weirdly intact. Like, sure, it's really self-referential, and you can also dream a demo of a game by Shujo Murata of Zone of the Enders 2 and later videos fame, but you did a nano machines not being a thing in the 60s shit's kept fairly down to in-console Earth. Though you can make Snake puke by rotating him in the character viewer. Rather than nano, shit's either historical or magical. The latter in the sense that, say, Volgan can conduct electric currents through his body, or that the pain can just shoot bees, which will actually be painfully explained by later games, but for now, they just leave it be. And the former coming in the former of the real world ties being turned up to a right scissoring 61. Mainly because they had a certain writer on board who did loads of research to beef up Kojima shit, who. Like, uh, remember that Cold War thing? The one that Kojima grew up in? Yeah, well, that. Everyone here is a person relating to a person or event that happened before, after, or during it. Big events like the Cuban Missile Crisis were ruses for villainous plot points in game. Orchestrated, even, by would-be patriots sticking people in certain positions so they could be here and so on. Besides me being too lazy to explain all of it verbatim, it makes the events in-game feel like they could have happened. Especially with how secretive governments actually were at the time, it's pretty fucking cool. The idea that Big Boss and Boss were real just covered up like Snake and Liquid would have been at the end of one is a really realistically neat bit of context. Just, uh... J j just ignore the fact that Russia doesn't have any jungles. Although, given the name Selino Yarsk and where it points on fake maps, it seems to imply to have taken place in a place called Tajikistan, which does actually look equally mountainous and has absurdly dense forests, so uh, 
Checkmate, bitch. And hey, even shit like these little floaty ships were based on actual blueprints of real ass shit being developed at the time. Not to mention that all weapons and even certain items of food are actually accurately realized and contextualized. You got some instant noodles, huh? Instant noodles? Uh-huh. It was invented in Japan just recently. Add some hot water and it's ready to eat. It's cheap and can be stored for a long time. And besides, it's delicious. It's like a miracle food. Wow. But yeah, Snake's here to destroy not Metal Gear and take out Volgan and Boss, which he does and so that's literally all of the plot. There aren't really any big, profound plot twists other than that Ocelot is indeed not doing what he say he do as he do a patriot already. Trying to get info to get them more power and stuff. And Eva is not at all who she say she be either. Both of which being alluded to quite fucking cleverly, I might add. Mother Russia can rot for all I care. Since when, Ocelot? When did you turn? I'm glad you noticed, comrade. I abandoned her during the Cold War. Well, that, but Eva's shit in particular gets quite deep as she's actually a Chinese double. Uh, spy. You could have known that right away as she uses Chinese weapons, carries around nothing but Asian food, and shoots using John Woo techniques. The Japanese called it bandit shooting and used to dread it. Makes you wonder where she learned to shoot like that. Yeah, it really does. Not to mention that when you first meet her, she doesn't know the agreed upon password, wiggling her way out of it using boobs. And that's she's also clearly this lady called Tatiana. Granin be all like, My shoes. Tatiana gave them to me. So then when he died by way of Vulgan torture, it is revealed that he had a transmitter in his shoe. None of this has really brought any attention to it all, but it is quite neat how it's all there in plain sight so one can piece it together upon replays. Which are kinda its main plot contributions overall, really. Subtly and themages. Sokolov is scientist. He pees his pants and is being used. No anime, but same aspiration. Wanting to be a spaceman. Arms race and space race are the same. Just politician wanting to show dick. Wow, so deep. <laughs> but for real though, that shit's pretty neat. Same with how the boss wants a world where soldiers are free to be loyal to themselves with their own values, not dying for some politician's ego. Thus, planting the seed within Big Boss to one day build his gnome-based outcast militia, as well as that then inspiring Liquid's anime terrorism and Solidus's anti-patriot rebellion. Plus, it is also heavily implied, by which I mean confirmed true just not stated out writing game, that Ocelot is the son of the boss and ghost man. Which makes his eventual liquidification rather cyclical as he ends up following his own mother's dreams without knowing. And making this even more ironic is seeing Big Boss teaching him the ropes. But that was some fancy shooting. You're pretty good. <sighs> pretty. Good. <sighs> also, uh, Boss Lady herself is the daughter of one of the founders of what would become the Patriots, and with Ocelot being their main lackey, it all comes full circle, like a snake eating itself. Not building upon MGS2 directly, but simply giving it a great deal of context and emotional strengths by making you love all of these funny, hokey bastards, later turned stoic military tough guy assholes. However, the main problem with this is, is that at some point, that self relating snake is going to implode, creating a vacuum black hole of nothingness in its wake. Which is pretty much where the series is headed, due to Konami forcing out more sequels that'll have to build upon this now perfectly rounded off little shit show. Spiraling the cycle ever downward. Another metaphor. Luckily, I guess, though, we ain't really quite there yet. As, you see, a few years after MGS2 would come out, an interesting thing happened. Being that they release a director's cunt version of sorts called Substance, adding just that. Not to the actual main game, mind you, but in the form of shit tons of VR missions, alternate universe scenarios, repeated running gags like the giant dudes, the ability to play as ninja, and also solid snake skates. And for three, they would do the same, only calling it subsistence which isn't the word, you've been looking at it even, as by far the biggest addition by far was the camera that didn't look like this, actually making the game playable. And also maybe an online mode. 
The servers is dead now, so I can't play it, nor was able to back then try as I might, but I have reason to believe that it was neat, as it had tons of cool maps, booby badass girls, fancy gear, and just loads of really dumb looking shit like this image of Liquid with a Davy Crockett. I'd have loved to have played it, as it would grow to have its own assortment of meta memes, but uh, yeah. MGS3, I suppose, is a masterpiece. It reviewed well, and it sold well, and it is my favorite game in the series, so you know. I'm, I'm sure everything will go very well from here on out. <laughs>